If you've watched network television during the past couple of decades, you must have noticed a smart young woman making the airwaves shimmer from New York to Iraq and all the places in between as she rose to the top ranks of network television, moving from CBS to NBC and later ABC, where she is best known as the longtime anchor of the award-winning news show 2020. But her rise was not easy, and the anxiety she felt along the way would eventually become complicated by denial and alcohol addiction, addiction that eventually led to multiple stints in rehab facilities around the country. Dealing with these issues in private is devastating, but to confront them in public takes unimaginable courage. To quote a Japanese proverb from the book, fall seven times, stand up eight. Standing tall before you tonight, please welcome Elizabeth Vargas and Philly's favorite anchor, Tamala Edwards of 6 ABC Action News. Well, thank you for coming out tonight. Really appreciate you being here, and it's a very brave book. And in it, you talk a lot about keeping things in, and it's interesting. Other people have said, why did you write it now, two years in? But what I wanted to know is why you wrote it at all, because you seem so private. You didn't want people to know. What made you say, no, I'm going to actually write about it? It's a great question. Um, I was in many ways terrified uh, to write this book and to tell these stories, um, but I, it was actually also an enormous relief. I think that, you know, I've battled anxiety all my life. I mean, that is, my earliest memories are infused with it, um, it marinated in fear. And when I was just six uh, years old and we were living in Japan, my dad was sent um, to Vietnam. And that's when I started having full out panic attacks every single day that he was at war. It was relentless. And you know, that was not a time when anybody was doing anything to help um, even the vets from the Vietnam War, much less the vets' kids. So um, I learned that year to keep that panic hidden because I remember when my mom went to the hospital one night to give birth to my baby sister um, and the neighbor lady came over to watch us and I started to have my panic attack as I saw my mom going into the car to go to the hospital and I, I started to make a run for her and this woman stopped me and said, what is the matter with you? And it was sort of like that message at six years old, I thought, this is shameful. Uh, this is something to be hidden. And that's what I proceeded to do for the rest of my life. And as an adult, you know, in the, I would say it really started, I, I was self-medicating as most women, we now know by, from experts, women are more prone to self-medicate, whether it's anxiety, depression, stress, even hormones. I mean, we just are more prone to that than men are. I self-medicated with alcohol starting in my 20s. I didn't drink before then. I drank normally moderately, like most other people, for 25 years, and then it fell off a cliff. You talk about even being a baby. <clears throat> Many people have had a baby cry it out. You would cry for hours. I had colic. I sound like a nightmare as a baby. <laughs> <laughs> I but wouldn't have wanted me. rocking to put yourself to sleep. Has anybody been able to help you figure <clears throat> out, is it just luck of the draw that this was just your thing, or there was some reason? You know, I have two children, and one of my children is anxious too, and had terrible separation anxiety in preschool. It was heartbreaking and gut-wrenching to drop him off, and I remember the most horrible scene the last uh, year of preschool. He was running around in circles in the classroom while all the other kids were out playing on this, you know, the play set, and he was running around in circles sobbing, saying, Mommy and Daddy, don't leave me, and I mean, I, it was like, and the teachers were like, get out right now. Um, but so I, he just has it. My second son doesn't. I had it. My brother and sister didn't. Um, so a little bit of it is just luck of the draw, which you're born with. You're born into this world with certain things, and that's what I was born into this world with. But I, the, so I think what happened was a lot of other external factors, like being an army brat and moving every year of my life and having absolutely no consistency. There wasn't a neighbor, a teacher, a counselor, a friend. There wasn't any common denominator. It was the five of us, and everything else changed every year. Our house, our school, our neighbors, our friends, the country we're living in, the army base, everything. And that can lead to a sense of, looking back, probably unsafety. 
although I was so insecure, I looked at it as a, you know, every, I get to wipe the slate clean every year and maybe I'll get it right this time, you know, and figure out the secret magic code that everybody else seems to know and I felt like I never did. You tell a story in the book where you've taken a beta blocker, which is supposed to sort of calm you down and you're anchoring. And one of the things I've always loved about you as an anchor is when you're on, it feels like you're in my living room, that you know you are there and you're comfortable. And people didn't realize just how hard it was and what you were going through. And I remember at one point I was on beta blockers and a correspondent said to me, don't ever tell. You can't mm. ever tell anybody that you get nervous. Really? Was that ever an aspect of this for you as well? This, at that level, you couldn't tell anybody that you're nervous. Certainly, I never yeah. told anybody I was nervous. I think one of my bosses, the president of the news division, who named me as anchor of the evening news with Bob Woodruff, I think he might have been able to tell a little bit because he said to me at one point, you know, Peter Jennings um, was really nervous too. And I was like, what? <laughs> Peter, the coolest cucumber, I mean, seriously. But I do remember um, the afternoon that John F. Kennedy Jr.'s plane crashed. It was on a Saturday, and I was called in, and I was, you know, and I'm sitting there, and, and let me just say, I love what I do. I love what I do. I have since I was in local news, earning $6 an hour, you know. I'm starving my way through the dues paying years, working my way up the ladder. I have loved what I do in this business from the moment I got into it. And I love it even in those moments once I get past that anxiety, which is usually in the lead up mm -hmm. to the newscast. It's the thinking about what I'm about to do that gets me completely freaked out. But th it, once I'm in, I call it being in the zone. And I remember, anyway, I was on the air anchoring this live breaking news coverage for hours without a prompter, without scripts, without. Um, commercial breaks, um, basically just thinking on your feet. People are sliding, you know, data to you about where the plane, you know, how high it was, how fast it was going, the passengers, blah, 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 blah. And I remember seeing out of the corner of my eye after, I, after a few hours, and the story was getting bigger and bigger and bigger, um, I saw Peter come in, and I thought, oh, well, he's going to come take over. But he, he took forever. Like, it, you know, I would see him wander around in, the, in and out of the hair and makeup room. I'm like, okay, what? I'm happy. I'm having a ball out here. Not having a ball, but... I'm doing well, and we're covering the story and praying for a, a happy outcome, although we, obviously we didn't get that. We didn't know at that point. And I, 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 I wondered later, because other people commented on it, if maybe he too was feeling that same sort of anxiety. You know, you never know. We all look at everybody else and think they've got it so cool and under control. And if I was this raging mix of nerves, who knows, maybe he was. I don't know. Um, but for me, it was the lead up to the newscast and mostly just the evening news. I didn't get anxious like that with Good Morning America, which I've also hosted um, for years and or 2020, the show that I continue to host, um, even with the breaking news event. I remember that with on the on the and I read about this in the book, the morning of John F. Kennedy's uh, plane crash. I remember I, I was rushing and I sat down and as I started to anchor um, for about after about 10 minutes, I desperately needed to take a sip of, I really wanted to take a sip of water. But I knew that my hands were still shaking so much that if I picked up the cup, the people in the control room would be able to see it, even though we might mm. be rolling videotape of the search that was happening on the ocean. So I, I waited until I was sure my hands were no longer shaking, even though I really wanted a sip of water before then. So that's just a, a little example of, your, of how I managed it and, and tried to keep it hidden. And yes, I was afraid if I told anybody that I was that anxious, they would say, oh, well, let's get somebody else. Yeah. So you mentioned <laughs> you drank fine for years, go out with colleagues, yeah. go out with family and friends. What would you, how would you describe the tip over into this being something else? You know, I've spent a lot of time and energy, um, even with a lot of um, experts in the field of recovery trying to figure out exactly what happened. All I can tell you is that, um, you know, that steady thrum of anxiety was there throughout my life. What I now know, after talking to a lot of experts and, and leaders in the field of addiction, and women especially, and alcohol, um, is that what happens when you're anxious and you, you start to drink a couple glasses of wine to soothe that anxiety, the problem is initially it works. It works at first. And you think, oh great, nothing else works. This works. But 
physiologically what happens is it begins to boomerang and backfire on you. And what I didn't know for many of those years is that uh, it, 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 it has the opposite effect after a certain point when you're drinking every single night and having a couple of glasses of wine every single night. It's no longer soothing the anxiety. It begins to fuel the anxiety. And I had one doctor who I interviewed for our special this past Friday night who explained to me that at a certain point, you're, with your body, there are physiological changes that happen, especially in a woman's body, which we know is more susceptible and, and vulnerable to alcohol physiologically than the male body. Um, after a while, she said, you needed two drinks just to feel normal. And that's when you're in trouble because two drinks just to get up to where you are every day or most of you are every day. And then I've got the anxiety that's mushrooming because I've been using alcohol to medicate it and it's now backfiring. So that's what conspires to lead you to the point where you begin to drink a lot more. I had that going on. I had just given birth to my second baby. Um, I was returning back to work. I was the, the sole breadwinner in my family and supporting um, my husband and two children. So I felt a lot of stress as the working breadwinner and yet you know, I wanted to be with this baby. I nursed him for eight months, but I went straight back to work after 10 weeks because that was all the paid leave that we could get. And so I had a lot of stress with that. I had just been demoted, um, taken off the evening news desk. I was very humiliated about that. I'm, I personalized that extremely when you really shouldn't. Uh, and I went, to, I was sure I had postpartum depression. I went to a, uh, two experts. I kept saying, there's something wrong. I, there, I don't feel right. I can't sleep. And they said, no, no, you're not depressed, you're just anxious. And I was like, oh, what do I do? I'll drink some wine and more wine and more. So that's when it all turned on me. And the story you mentioned before you got married, your ex-husband says to you, I think you drink too much and you don't react well, is, is often the case in this back and forth. But was he the only person to see it? Did anybody else early on see anything, say anything? No, nobody even saw later on. I was magnificently efficient at uh, leading a double life. <laughs> um, I was, I am so disciplined in every other aspect of my life. Um, and part of that worked against me. I kept thinking, why can't I get it together? You know, what is wrong with me? It is, I've got to just try harder to be more disciplined, not, not understanding the fact that this is a, you know, a, a disease, according to the medical community, that it, it had changed my brain. It had hijacked the way physiologically I was reacting to alcohol. Um, and you can't just uh, use willpower to willpower your way out of that. If it were that easy, we wouldn't have people drinking themselves to death every day in this country. Um, you know, 40 million people suffer from anxiety. 30 million people last year in this country suffer from some alcohol-related disorder. And here's an interesting statistic. 62% of the women who are classified, designated as alcoholics in this country also suffer from anxiety. There is an enormous link between the two, so much so that um, leaders in the field of recovery are now looking at different ways to treat people who are anxious because people who are anxious are twice as likely to relapse. Something that keeps happening is events that should crater instead become successes. 9-11, you wake up, you're hungover. By the end of the night, though, it's a startling success. People are reminded yet again just how great you are on breaking news. Did that affect you in some way that rather than being cut down by the fact you woke up hungover, you powered through, you made it through? No, it was about that time that I cut back. And I think that was probably more what led me to cut back. That and the fact that I wanted to have children. And I thought, you know, once I got over being angry at my then fiance from, for saying something to me, I, I thought I should cut back. And I did cut back. So, you know, go figure. Um, I, was I not an alcoholic then? I, yeah, I, don't, I don't know the answers to this. As I say in the very first page of my book, I do not claim to be an expert on alcoholism, even though I suffer from it. I don't claim to be an expert on anxiety, even though I've lived every day of my life in the grip of it. But I, I don't know what the answer to that is. But I think that at that point in my life, I was still able to bounce back. You know, um, 
I would venture to say there are a few members of our audience here who have woken up with a hungover, a hangover at some point in their life. Um, you know, my solution was hop on the treadmill at the gym, sweat it out, work it out, you know, and I did. So being really disciplined in that aspect of my life enabled me to keep this one part of my life, this drinking part of my life, a secret far longer than I probably should have. Then you talk about the nanny crisis of 2009 yeah. and it begins a chain of events and I wanted to sort of step through some of these things and the lessons you took from them. The first time you go to rehab, it's a beautiful place out in Utah. It's a month long program and you say, no, 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 let's do this in two. Yeah, how's that for denial? Can I, I'm just coming for two weeks. But I would imagine a lot of people go through that where they think, I can't get the time, I, I can expedite yeah. this. Yeah, well, I convinced them. My shame was so deep. And I think that's, you know, listen, I was on NPR this morning talking about this for an hour with an um, expert from, Har from Harvard on women and alcohol and anxiety. And somebody called in and said, you know, um, how do I confront this person in my life about their drinking? I don't know what to say. It's killing us. It's killing him. And I gave her a few, you know, whatever tips that I could give her. But I did say, you know, whatever you do, don't shame him. Mm -hmm. Because the alcoholic feels so much shame about what they're doing to themselves that it, it's it, more shame will just make them drink more because I don't want to feel it, you, you know. Um, I had so much shame around my drinking. I didn't feel I could tell my boss that I needed to go to rehab. So I said, I have to have some surgery, you know, and I need two weeks off. And I, I lied and I took two weeks and I somehow convinced this rehab to let me come for just two weeks, which is, you know, just ridiculous. Um, and of course I was back there for a whole month, you know, three months later uh, doing it the right way. Um, and that was a really good experience. I, I, I loved that place. It was the first time in my entire adult life I had taken time off for myself. I had started working, you know, I worked my way through college and started working the day after I graduated from college and went boom, 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 you know, job to job to job and never took time off. So it was really a great experience, but they sent me home with this. They would be sure you've got to do this and this and this and this and this. And I didn't do any of it. I just came home and thought, okay, I'm cured, bum, and, you know, not realizing that this is something you're never cured of. You have to work at it every single day, every day. But it seems as though even after the second time you go back for the full month, it's, you come back, things are good, but you didn't completely take that lesson. When you come back the second time, right, life is I mean. good. Yeah. And I didn't, I, life was great. I was hosting Good Morning America during that time. I was you know, uh, work was going well, things were, it, it seemed to be okay. And then I had a big setback uh, about seven months after I got home from rehab and, you know, couldn't figure out how to soothe myself. And that was the first time I drank a glass of wine. So I hadn't used those seven months to, as they call it, work your program. You know, how do you, how do you stay sober? You work your program, whatever that program is for you. And you talk about going to a different place for the third time. And as I read about that, the setback on the interview, the stress, the things at home. When you look back, did you think, if you had made a change, if you said, this is just too much, I'm going to change this aspect or that aspect, would it have made a difference or no? It just, this slide was coming. If you said, I want to do a different job or I want to do something differently in my life, this stress is too much, this anxiety is too much. No, I would, ne I, I would never say the stress is too much for this job. I, I would say, um, well, first of all, I, you know, I had a disease. Um, and I think that my biggest mistake, if I could go back and change anything, it would have been to find out much years, decades ago, um, had sought help for my anxiety, mm -hmm. true help. I mean, unfortunately, most of the times when you go to a doctor and say, I'm anxious, they'll write you a prescription for Valium or Clonopin or whatever it is. Um, and that's not, you know, that can help you with the symptoms. It's not going to help you with the anxiety and the panic attacks. You know, what, what you have to eventually look at what's causing that. And that's what I never did until I finally you know, got sober, when you're forced to, because you can't take the pills and you can't drink anymore, you've got to look at what's happening and figure out ways to deal with it. And you step people in the book through each time you go, and then there is that last time that happens in California. 
what, it, it, because it was frightening, you know, it got to the point where it seems that you could feel it in the book, that you didn't know what it was going to take. What was different about that last time? I don't know. You know, you will, there is a, a book out there called Moments of Clarity, um, and it's essays by all these very famous people who have all gotten sober, and they all write about the moment of clarity that they had when they realized, I gotta stop. And what you learn by reading these essays is that it doesn't have to be, sometimes it's not the thunderbolt or the DUI arrest or the, it's not the very worst thing that happens to you, it's just the something happens inside where you just say, I give up. Uh, I can't do this anymore. Um, I realized at the end, if I didn't stop, I was going to lose every single thing that meant anything to me. I was going to lose my children. I would lose uh, my job, which is the only way I, s I still support my children and my ex-husband. I was going to lose uh, friends and family. I was going to lose my life, you know. <laughs> Did I want that to happen? And, and I, just, I just, finally, I just, you, I'm a very slow learner, apparently. <laughs> I don't know. It, it finally got in the thick skull, and uh, I thought, okay. And it also happened to happen around the same time that I met a wonderful woman out in California through a mutual friend of ours. Um, and she was just amazing. And she came and stayed with me for a little while, and she'd been sober for, she's going to be sober for 30 years next month. And she basically sat and talked me through it and, you know, made me write a timeline out of my entire adult life and the drinking, you know, and it, there weren't very ma many dramatic episodes until very recently when there were a lot of them. Um, but she made me notice that, you know, even early on, everybody else was drinking to feel good and I was drinking not to feel something. I was drinking not to feel anxious. I was drinking not to feel insecure. I was drinking not to feel afraid. Um, so it was, it, was an, it was an interesting revelation. Working with her was uh, really amazing. And she was always loving and always supportive. And after sort of enduring a really rough year where I felt like I was very, I constantly felt like I was being shamed mm -hmm. or like your nose is being rubbed in your mess, you know. Um, it was a much more effective way for me to put it all down and reach out. You write about the effect on your, your family, uh, including your sister, your brother, your parents. The well, they're the ones who saved me. My, my sister and brother and my mom and dad are the ones who saved me. There's a, the line that made me tear up in the book is when your brother comes to see you at one of the last rehabs and he says, you light up the room when you walk into it, Beth. Don't walk into it drunk. Mm, yeah. And it just I felt like you, I was like, oh, <laughs> when he said that to me. That was during a really interesting, um, the, the second rehab I went to wasn't, might have been not the best place for me, but it did have some amazing, uh, this amazing program called Family Weekend, every other family, every other weekend, and family members would come. It could be spouses, parents, siblings. It's, it was usually spouses and parents. And that was an exercise we did there called Regrets and Requests. And each, you know, addict, sits opposite each family member, and they read aloud, or aloud a, a list of regrets and requests. And you're not allowed to say, I regret that you drank. <laughs> you can't say that, it has to be something you did. Um, and it was, and he said that during, you know, I request, I request that you not walk into the room drunk, which was. Very touching. Yeah. Was, um, he was great. My brother came to a family weekend, and my mom and my dad both came to a family weekend. So it, it meant a lot. Throughout the book, as you write about telling people, you're almost surprised sometimes at how kind people can be. And there's one mm. point where you say, I didn't realize I could ask for help. And I wanted to talk about that because I bet there are a lot of people dealing with it who think if I tell people will not be kind, I cannot ask for help. And that was really a surprise for you. It was. Now, that's not to say all people are kind. Um, there are certain pe certainly people yeah. out there who you wish were more kind um, and less judgmental. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, 
I spent my whole life scared to show my vulnerable side. I, I, was, I spent my whole life determined not to let anybody see my fear, my anxiety, my panic, my worry, my stress. Um, like it's my duty, I have to be strong and shoulder on and I still have to every day, like rem I don't have to be the strongest person in the room, okay? You know, it's okay to turn to somebody else and say, I, can you help me? Um, and I somehow got that perverted in my own mind into thinking asking for help was a sign of weakness and that was bad. And it's not a sign of weakness and it's not bad. It's actually smarter to ask for help when you don't know the answer. It's smarter to say, I'm feeling a little anxious right now. Can you talk me through this if you're on a bumpy flight on a plane? Some guy did that to me once. He took my hand and said, can I hold your hand? And you know what? He was a complete stranger and it was a really bumpy flight and we were all like really nervous and scared. And it was so me talking him through, like he took, I said, sure, hold my hand. And I said, you know, I, I told him through everything I know about airplanes and how safe they are. And so in the, in the, <laughs> In the process of telling him all this and calming and soothing him, I calmed and soothed myself. There you go, you know? And if he hadn't said to me, can I hold your hand? Which, you know, somebody might have said, what? You know, if he hadn't said that, we both would have suffered in silence side by side. So there you go. This is a lifelong struggle. Yeah. You've seen what you could possibly lose. How? How scared are you of relapse, and how do you deal with that fear? Um, you know, I don't think one should ever, uh, in recovery, say, I'm done, I'll never relapse. Because that's a person who's headed for a relapse, in my opinion. Um, I think by working on the things that I do every day, which whether it's meditating, which I try and do every day, I still really have to, you know, force myself to insert 20 minutes. I try and do twice a day. Ha! Huh. If I can get once a day, I feel like I've got a star by my name. Um, you know, prayer is a big part of my recovery. Meeting with other alcoholics, talking together—that's a big part of my recovery. Um, as long as I do those things, I don't feel it's not. I don't live every day, in other words, going, oh my God, I hope I don't relapse today. Mm -hmm. um, what I do try and do is live every day thinking, what do I need to be grateful for today? Hmm. You know, what do I need to be happy about today? And my biggest problem is I've got to let go of all the oh, guilt and anxiety and why tortured, why did I do that about yesterday? And the, oh my God, what's gonna happen tomorrow and what can I do to make sure something happens to, just relax a little bit more in today and what is happening right now. Because you can be so busy with yesterday and so busy with tomorrow that today is tomorrow and before you know it and then you're, you know what I mean? You're never in the moment. And being in the moment is one of the best ways I know um, to stay sober. And you talk about your children and every day trying to move forward into a, a great future for them. And you also talk about some things that didn't come back. The marriage is undercut by this. And people, for all lots of different reasons, deal with regret. And as I read the book, I thought, this is an interesting journey on making your peace with some things that you just can't undo. And what is your advice on that? On regret? Yeah. Um... It is very tempting, you know, especially if you're my personality type. It's not regret. It goes far beyond that into the destructive, which is the guilt and the shame, and that's bad. I mean, do we have regrets? We all have regrets. Um, I can't change what happened. I can only be better now. Uh, I had a friend of mine say, uh, say recently in an interview who had his own um, very public, very uh, vilified um, relapse. He said the best way to say I'm sorry is to change yourself. You know, um, after a while, just saying I'm sorry doesn't do it. You have to change the way you're dealing with life and walking through the world because um, that shows that you're really sorry. If you're really sorry, you don't just say I'm sorry, you change the way you live your life so that you're not making those mistakes and stepping on those toes the way you were. You said something in the special on ABC that I thought was uh, 
very memorable, something you say to yourself a lot, that when you ask God a question, the oh, answer comes favorite. back in three ways. Yes, not now, and I have something better for you. How does that help you see life through a certain filter, what you've been through? I absolutely love that, by the way. That's why I told Diane that. I, I, and I, I, I must say it to myself at least every other day, if not more often, because we can all get caught up in, oh, why isn't this happening for me? Or why isn't that you know, happening? And, and they have that. How come I don't have that? And or were you, you know, are you getting caught up in praying to God for something? And, and, you know, and why isn't it happening? Why aren't you answering my prayers? Why isn't this happening for me? I'm working hard at this. And it's very comforting to me because I think that we don't always know what's in store for us. And I can look back over my own life and see that exact thing. You know, the happenstance meetings that led to unbelievable developments in my life or how you can look back and so clearly see how that one decision to go to that, to you know, for me to go to the U.S. Open, this one, you know, in 1999, uh, you know, that's how I met my ex-husband. It was so perchance and so freakishly, you know, almost didn't happen that that's a, you can look back and see dozens of those points in your life where something happened just barely. And I don't know, there might be a dozen more of those in store for me in the next coming years. Relax, let go of it, understand and trust that what will be, will be. What's meant to be, will be. If it's not meant to be, I spent my entire life trying to jam a square peg into a round hole. And it's a, at a certain point, you gotta put the peg down and just go, okay, you know, show me what to do next. And that's why I love that prayer so much, I love it. Yeah, I, my uh, oldest son is 13 years old. He's in middle school. How many people here want to go back to middle school? Uh. No one. It's the worst time in anybody's childhood and adolescence. So yeah, when I, I said, you know, I, I'm writing this book, and he was like, oh, Mom, I'm so proud of you. And I said, well, honey, I'm a little worried. I, I just don't want it to embarrass you. And he said, why? And I said, because the book is about when I used to drink. And he said, Mom. I'd be embarrassed if you were still drinking. <laughs> and that, you know, here I am raking myself over the coals and self-flagellating every day. You know what I mean? Kids can, you know, for them, two years ago is ancient history. Now, does that mean we put the, we wrap that up and put that away and never look at that again? Absolutely not. I watched the special with them on Friday night. Um, I'm, you know, I'm there to answer any questions. As they grow older, the questions will change and become different and become more sophisticated, and you have to be ready to answer everything. So, but it's, it was a great gift to me to, you know, to have that response. Right now, they just seem to be proud. I was, you know, I was really anxious this week because I was really afraid that, you know, some kids might tease them or whatever, but so far, so far, so good. I have had anxiety issues and my family runs in my family, so I totally can relate to what you're saying. My question is, from, have, you, have you also sought help from a behavioral psychiatric um, point of view in addition to the alcoholism? Because, you know, I know that there's help better living through chemistry <laughs> through yeah. a lot of the drugs out there, and there's a lot of anti-anxiety medication. So I'm wondering how that plays into your story and whether or not that was something that you looked at and just decided that you didn't need that. You know, I, um, uh, I had a panic attack once on an airplane and that was the worst thing that ever happened to, I mean, not the worst thing, but obviously my book, there's a lot of more <laughs> worse things in the book. Um, th but that was scary because like, you know, you can't get off, you can't get out. Y you know, I was, I literally thought this was before I n understood that you can't, you literally physically cannot open an airplane door mid-flight. It's not possible. But I thought I was going to, you know, and it so scared me by the time the plane landed, I went to see my doctor and I think I finally told him, I said, I, I am having panic attacks and I had one on an airplane and it scared me. And he gave me a prescription of, for Ativan and I carried it around in my purse for five years and never took one. <laughs> But just knowing I had it there, that if I started to feel that horrible panic, um, that helped me. Um, so I guess that's sort of a prophylactic use for, <laughs> for drugs. Um, I, I, 
personally, that's just not, um, I, I, would, I don't want to have to take medication. There's also things you can do, behavioral things that, you know, all the rehabs, any decent rehab out there will teach an, an addict these kinds of things, these coping skills. You know, I had to um, work in, in, in a very demanding newsroom. I saw a lot of those skills I feel like I already knew. For me, it was just more of a, a first of all, I had to get the alcohol out of my system for a long time so that your body can reset physiologically. And all that anxiety I was amping up and fueling with all those years of self-medicated drinking was able to finally subside a little bit. All I can tell you is I'm less anxious now than I was, I think, all my life. So something's working, uh, whether it's the absence of alcohol, com probably the absence of alcohol combined with a good healthy dose of all the other life skills, life managing skills that I use. It sounds kind of puny and flimsy, but it really isn't. That's all I can tell you, it just really isn't. Is there also a power of, it's out now, everybody knows, I don't have to be scared about Huge. it, carry it around? You know, I lived in total, part, of, and that is part of the reason I wrote this book. I mean, mostly because if I could spare somebody else a little bit of the pain that I experienced, that would be great. Or, you know, somebody else could avoid the wreckage instead of stepping right into it and causing it as I did. Um, but yeah, there were some people who knew some of the stories in this book. And I lived in fear for the last two. I was in rehab when somebody called the press and said, Elizabeth, <clears throat> Elizabeth Vargas is seeking treatment for alcoholism. I mean, I had to issue a statement, a public statement um, from rehab and then call my kids and warn them it would be in all the newspapers the next day. So that, that was a real, it was really horrible to be outed. Um, and I was outed three different times. So it was really, you know, this was part of me just saying, okay, I'm gonna rip the Band-Aid off. I'm gonna tell every horrible story there is. Judge me if you will. You have the right, whatever. Um, I hope you'll be kind and let's all move on. What's amazing about your story is, my name's Robert and I'm in recovery, I'm an alcoholic. And what's amazing about your story is that you were able to control your drinking for that period of time. And my question is that, did you ever ask yourself early on, did you ever have episodes in college, right after college, in your 20s, where you questioned yourself of whether you were an alcoholic before it became apparent to anyone else? and before you went into your deep spin? Never. <laughs> I didn't drink in college at all. I barely drank in high school. I went to high school in Germany where it was legal you know, to drink. Um, I hated beer, so in college all there is is beer. So I never, and I worked, I waited tables and, uh, and I had a partial scholarship. So I, had, I just worked through college. I really didn't start drinking until I was in my early 20s, and then it wasn't every night, and then it was only, it was very, it was very moderate, N nothing different from anybody else, really for the next 25 years. Um, it wasn't until I started having hangovers, like the one that I had when I woke up on 9-11, um, that I started thinking, I just shouldn't feel this way. This is not good. And not surprisingly, after that, that was my first attempt at moderating, and I did. So, you know, that actually, in, in retrospect, probably um, hampered me, because then in a few years, when again I started drinking too much, uh, you know, I, I kept thinking, well, I should be able to moderate this, and at that point, I no longer could. I, I just couldn't. Do you care to comment on Alcoholics Anonymous or whether Alcoholics Anonymous is a part of your story? Um, on that part of my recovery, I choose to keep that private. Um, so uh, I, it's a, I hear it's a great organization and help, it helps many people, but what I personally do, I, I keep that private, but thank you for asking. I just got your book on Tuesday, so I'm only halfway through it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> congratulations. That's Thank the first you. thing. I've been recording this whole thing, if that's okay. I don't mean... Uh, my brother has... Exactly how long have you been sober? It, it's enough time. I don't give You don't? Okay. I, yeah. I, I, forgive me. That's my okay. brother will be one year on October 21st. That's and, great. Um, I'm so proud of him. And that's one of the biggest reasons I'm here, is to hear how other people deal with it. And... Um, because I'm recording this, can you just say 
something you wanted to hear when you were struggling initially. Sure. So I can let him hear Okay. It. What's his name? Christopher. Oh, that's my brother's name. Um, Christopher, I would tell you something that stuck with me when I was trying to get sober. A friend of my sister's called me and said, getting sober is so much harder than staying sober. And she was so right. Um, I can tell you two things. It gets easier and it gets better. Much, much better. Congratulations on one year. Keep up the great work. And it's a great life waiting for you. Thank you. Um, I like that you talked about uh, prayer and those three responses that you got. Mm. And um, I was just wondering, is that something that you had your whole lifetime, the relationship that you talk about with God? Is it something that you struggled with uh, initially upon getting sober, or was it kind of a natural progression? Um, for me, I was raised Catholic in a very Catholic home. Um, so the idea of God and praying to God is not uh, foreign. In fact, it's very familiar and very comforting. Um, there was a, I, I did a, about half a dozen primetime specials for ABC on religion, and they were, they were some of my favorite projects I've ever done. So um, I actually loved, um, that actually strengthened my faith, doing, invest, like applying, like interviewing scholars. I actually went to Israel, for example, and interviewed a Jewish scholar for an hour-long special I did on the resurrection. You know, the fact that different parts of Christianity believe in, you know, is it literally a resurrection or is it metaphorical? Um, how, you know, it was interesting. But I interviewed um, a Jewish scholar who has spent his entire adult life studying something he doesn't believe happened. <laughs> and his, um, I'm so off topic now, I'm sorry, okay. but his response when I said, when my favorite, it gave me goosebumps, and, it's, and um, he said to me, I don't know what happened after what we know is the historical, by historical fact, the crucifixion of this guy, Jesus. He said, I don't know what happened, but something happened. Because all those people, you know, who ran in, and, and I was like, wow. So I don't know, for me, um, it wasn't a huge leap. Um, and, but I will tell you, I did a lot less uh, thank you God prayers uh, and, and during most of my life. It was more what we call the Santa Claus God. You know, <laughs> hi, hi God, I need, can you please give me? Um, and that's changed for me. Um, I, I try every single night to make a gratitude list. You know, it might, I'm just lying in bed with my eyes closed, right about to fall asleep, but it's like, okay, what am I grateful for today? And if you do that every day, it starts to change your mindset. You start to appreciate more and, st and take less for granted, which is a, you know, you don't have to be an alcoholic to do that, by the way. You, anybody can do it. <laughs> this just popped in my head from a, another friend. In the book, you talked about a number of things that you weren't able to get to because of the drinking, namely the issues with your husband. You guys mm -hmm. couldn't get to them because you were stuck on the drinking. And she said to me that after she got sober, a tough thing was all the things she was ignoring and putting her life back together, she now had to confront those things and oh, look yeah. at them. Was that an issue for you, those things that you just kind of pushed aside and now you gotta deal with them? Um, I guess a little bit. Um, you know, I didn't, I think the hardest thing for me, uh, definitely, and I write about this in the book, um, was the, uh, end of my marriage and the way it ended, it was very painful to me. And, and um, you know, I always have to take full responsibility for my decisions to use alcohol to soothe myself or numb myself. Um, but it was, it was very, you know, they tell you in rehab, in early sobriety, um, and this is another tip for Christopher, in your first year of sobriety, don't make any big life-changing decisions. Your, your sobriety is too fragile. You're just, you're trying to learn to navigate the world the way everybody else does without this cushion and this uh, weapon of numbing yourself to everything that hurts or feels really, really scary and really, really bad. So the whole, th it can be overwhelming. Um, so I think that was probably, there wasn't, but in that case it wasn't, I didn't have to confront things and make decisions. They were basically, I, I was just learning to live with the new realities. Now, thank you for your strength in coming before us. But a question I have, 
Many of us, those of us in our 60s say, have been in corporations where there's a zero tolerance for an individual being in a position where their decision making or interactions can be compromised. Help us in your career, not your personal, but your career response to the serious issues you have. I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, the were you facing a challenge where people cognizant of your problem may have put you in a position where you could have lost employment, for example? No, I was, that's part of, um, you know, part of my story is that I was a very highly functioning alcoholic, um, which, you know, okay, great for me for being highly functioning while I'm doing something very self-destructive at night, but uh, that led me, I, I might have, it, was, it took me a lot longer to admit I had a problem because I was so highly functioning and a lot longer to seek proper treatment. Um, you know, I was able, remarkably, to do my job and to do it very, very well. I'm in an extremely competitive industry uh, where you don't get to the top by anything other than really hard work and stellar work. And I did stellar work for ABC for 20 years. Um, we had to, in fact, for my special with Diane, look very long and very hard to find an example of me looking hungover in a shoot. Um, you know, I've done thousands and thousands of hours of television for this network, and we could find hardly anything. So that's how, um, how well I sadly managed a serious problem. The mere fact that um, I could, you know, be drinking that destructively at night and somehow get it together. I mean, I never, for example, ever, ever, ever drank. Like, and this is what mystifies me. When, when I was doing Good Morning America, when you have to be up at four o'clock in the morning and it's a live to our broadcast and you are matching wits on live television, doing all these interviews, you know, thinking on your feet intensely. I rarely drank before I did those shows. So, you know, I was just able somehow to manage it. But I think that, you know, ultimately that backfired on me because it took me that much longer to admit I had a problem. Hi, thanks for sharing your story. Um, I'm an addictions counselor and I was wondering if you had anything that you'd like to say to um, people in the field that you think could be helpful in terms of being supportive, you know, being on the other side of it that you would, or maybe experiences you had hope that a counselor could have brought differently or any of the professionals, maybe more empathy or just if you have any words of wisdom for the people who are trying to help those in recovery, it'd be helpful. Well, bless you for trying to help us. <laughs> and I, you're the expert, not I. I can just tell you, um, uh, you know, and this came up again, I, I referenced that show that I was on this morning with that, um, expert in alcoholism and anxiety, especially as it pertains to women. And the whole thing about shaming, I just think, um, you know, part of the reason why the second rehab I went to, and I described the conditions in the book, um, I, I, part of the reason why it didn't work for me is it felt very punitive and very shaming to me. And that, I just couldn't get better in that environment. I have felt so much shame my whole life because I was ashamed of my anxiety. I was ashamed that you know, I was ashamed I was bullied. I felt like I somehow deserved that. Um, even as a adult, when I was, you know, there's a lot of hate, my business is tough. And there was, I was, I've been hazed in my business. And I never, it never occurred to me to go to HR when something happened. I was immediately, I just wanted to get rid of it, like get rid of it right away because I was so embarrassed. Because ultimately what I thought is I deserved that. And I was afraid everybody would see that I deserved that. So shame is just, I don't know, I think it's the worst thing you can do. The worst thing you can do to somebody who's you know, struggling with addiction because they feel so much of that inside and undoubtedly that's part of the reason why they're drinking or using is to try, people do that. They, don't, they do that because there's something so horrible that they're feeling that they will do anything not to feel it. 
you know, and I think just understanding that, because if people who don't have an, a, an addiction problem might have a hard time understanding that. The same way I think people don't have anxiety. It's like trying to explain a panic attack or anxiety to somebody who doesn't have it. It's actually kind of hard, you know? Are you aware whether there's any alcoholism or addiction in your family? I am the daughter of an alcoholic, and I know that it runs in. My mom died of her disease at 52. Wow. I know. Wow. And it was, it was all over my family, a nice yeah. Jewish family. Imagine that, everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> that man is Shevitz, right? <laughs> Um, yes, there's a definitely a genetic link. Uh, there is no alcoholism in my direct family, but I do have an aunt and an uncle who suffer from it. Apparently, when it comes to the genetic link, it only relates to your direct family. So even though I have an aunt and uncle who suffer from it, I was told that I don't have direct genetic links. If you do have a direct genetic link, a parent or a sibling who suffers from addiction, you are 50% more likely, according to experts, to also be at risk of, of suffering from this disease. Uh, but you're half, that means you know, you're also 50% likely not to. So let's look at the glasses half full. <laughs> um, in other words, I think it, listen, my children have a mother who is an alcoholic. And you can bet I will talk to them about that. But I'll be honest, I'll talk to them a lot more about learning how to sit with uncomfortable feelings because not you know okay who in here has a direct genetic link I don't know who in here has had an uncomfortable awful feeling that you didn't really want to feel probably all of us so I think that you know that's what I'll be spending a lot of time talking to them about all right our thanks to Elizabeth Vargas thank you